Thank you so much, Angela. Okay, Tom, phew. So let's start this over again. Uh, you were diagnosed at a young age with Asperger's. So um, can you tell everybody, um, how was it, first off, let's start with school. Diagnosed with Asperger's, how was it when you were in school? Let's say with the students, the other kids, and with the, the staff, how was it for you? Wow. Um, <clears throat> not good. Uh, back then, autism and Asperger's was a very new thing. Uh, I, I officially didn't get diagnosed until I was 11. But remember him back just from first grade, even kindergarten. Uh, first grade, you know, I, I did have meltdowns. I did. I was the weird kid. Nobody wanted to be around the weird kid. The uh, teachers just assumed I was lazy, and I just learned differently. Um, I had some pretty horrific experiences with uh, teachers and kids. Kids are mean. They have been. It was like, oh, yeah, kids are mean lately. No, the kids have been mean all throughout, you know, any time. Especially if you're different, especially if you do things differently, especially if you have a weird approach. Um, I did. I, I was not considered normal in the eyes of a lot of people. I took a lot of harassment from kids, took a lot of harassment from teachers. Um, people talk about the horror stories that kids with autism being bullied by teachers. It's It's not... It's not unfactual. It's 100% true because I've experienced it. I know what it's like. Um, I had mentioned before to other people, you know, there was a time I had a meltdown in third grade. My third grade teacher slapped the glasses off my face. My fifth grade teacher locked me into the school health room when I was in fifth grade. Left me down there all day. Wow. I, just because she got tired of me. Yeah, you know, Tom, um, speaking of that as well, um, when my son Nathan was in public school, um, they thought it'd be a good idea to withdraw him out of the classroom and put him in a closet-sized room with his EA and work from there all day and walk around the school with... Um, a chain with a, a sign on it that says quiet. Uh, I happened to come in one day and seeing my son was in this room and he had this quiet sign on and I went right to the school board. Right, I, I drove right down to the school board and demanded to see the superintendent and told them we have issues and these things are going to change because, you know, every student belongs in a classroom inclusively. And if the adults cannot accept that, then they're not in the right field. I mean, when, when my son was, when I was fighting to have him inclusive into the classroom, uh, unfortunately, it wasn't heard of then. Uh, a lot of parents sent their kids to um, other schools, um, as the principal stated in my son's school, where they belong. They belong in their community school is where they belong, their neighborhood school. Yeah. All in all, it, I had to fight, and I mean fight, and go to the media to get my son in an inclusive classroom with his twin sister. Now, I gave wow. them right that if he couldn't handle it in the classroom, if he started being overwhelmed, even with the modifications, remove him out of the classroom for 10 or 15 minutes, take him for a walk, and bring him back in. He'll be fine. And he was. And he proved to the principal and to the teachers it can be done if you're willing to work with the student and with the parents to modify programming and set it up appropriately. And it's easier on the EAs as well. They don't feel isolated as well. So what you're saying is the same sort of thing happened to you. Yeah. So how now did I've... that change then? How did it change? Yeah. Um... I did get some help uh, when I was younger. Um, I had gone to, I had a lot of physical limitations too. 
I, I couldn't ride a bike until I was 11 years old. I couldn't run until I was five. So there were physical limitations. So I did go to physical therapy. I did do some educational therapy when I was younger and in junior high and high school. And uh, things had changed, and I had to work twice as hard to get the same distance as everybody else. Um, I didn't even know until the last day of school until I, if I was going to graduate from high school or not. Oh, really, eh? And what? people actually told told me they said we need to find you a trade we need to find you something where you can get go a couple months get certified and you could do some menial labor position it's like people didn't have a lot of high hopes for me no but, but you uh, them wrong didn't you i mean oh you yeah have, with the help of your parents i'm assuming and did, my mom okay did the school come around and and help you with any modifications or which was it just outside of the school where you got the extra help i got some outside help and uh, that was about it wow. most of the time the school thought is like we need to put you here we need to put you here i don't think you can comprehend or handle this spot here and so, I'm, i i just want i just want to go back to those people now and say i don't think you're going to be able to comprehend how much i proved you wrong and uh watch out for the falling glass because i just shattered through the ceiling yeah so, Tom, so did they modify anything for you, or was it still a challenge for you in school? Um, did you struggle, even with the outside help? Um, like, let the viewers know, like, how did you accomplish getting through public school without the school helping you? I had a little bit of help. Um, they wanted to modify some stuff with me. Um, I had one person thought that humiliation would help and they've my dad even said yeah your mom's going to come to school with you every day and that wouldn't have helped at all especially in social circles it'd be like oh your mama's boy you know and stuff and a lot of times there was sometimes i was very prideful i wanted to do it on my own and um there's sometimes i didn't i needed to ask for help like when i was in college I asked for every single little help I got in culinary school. I got into school early. I studied as much as I could. The my teachers couldn't believe how hard I worked. I I went to school full time and worked full time and I still graduated with a a three point GPA. You know, that to some people like, oh you didn't go any higher. It's like for me that's a huge accomplishment. That's a milestone. I got a college degree. So, yeah. yeah, I did a lot of stuff I did do on my own just from sheer determination. You know what? And, and Tom, I think a lot of it comes down to, you know, a, a whole host of, let's say, a small community, the school, the teachers, the principal, the EAs, uh, the student themselves, everybody collectively to try and help um, a student get through school. And if one of those aren't willing to help, then it's a challenge to get to the end result. You can still do it, but it's yeah. still a challenge. So, you know, the bullying, you had the bullying from, you're saying, the adults. How about students? All the time, every day. Like what? There are day calling or? Oh, name calling, you know, I can, if I, if I could, if I counted how many times I was called the word, the R word, I yeah. hate that word with a passion. Yeah. If I could count how many times I was called that, I would own a $6 million restaurant. If I got counted how many times, oh, you're stupid, you're weird, you're a nerd, you don't know what you're doing. So, Tom, let me ask you something, okay? It's something that, obviously, I couldn't ask the other day because uh, technical difficulties we were having with echoing. So, what would you, not in a short sentence either, what would you suggest to parents that have a family member, their own loved one, that's in public school right now, it doesn't matter where it is around the world that's having challenges 
with educators or just being in an inclusive classroom or being segregated and the parents wanting them in an inclusive classroom. What do you suggest giving some tools, any suggestions to the people watching? My suggestion is, I think, I think that the, um, I think that the school should have an assembly that they should talk to kids and they should educate them and have a separate time. They should educate them about what certain disabilities are. And then I say, hey, you might know some kids at our own school who have these disabilities and introduce them because some people might not know about it. It's something that may, they may not understand. I feel like if kids and adults and educators can understand these disabilities more, then they can accept them and they can help find solutions and they can be a part of what we need to do to fix the things that go on around there. Um, believe me, I when I first found out I was diagnosed with autism, I didn't understand it. I had to research it. I had to, ex I had to learn about it. There's other students that I have as an educator myself who have certain traits, traits and um, disabilities themselves. Um, I once had a student who had Prader-Willi syndrome and I had to understand that and I had to make sure that, you know, we accommodated for that. Okay, but that's, and, uh, that's yeah. for the students. That's for the students. What would you suggest for the adults um, besides just um, an, an assembly? Because I've had an assembly as well for my son and some of the students asked an awful lot of questions, but it does come down to an awful lot of the adults being educated on how to address issues that might come up in the classroom and how to incorporate the teaching skills or even the modifications for that student that might happen to be in the classroom that might not even have an EA helping them in that at that time. What would you suggest? I suggest that adults just do their homework on it before they just, you know, educate before you discriminate. That's that's my main suggestion is educate yourself and know what you're getting into before you decide, oh, I don't want to be around one of those people. That's another term I hate. Yep. I've been referred to as one of those people, and it's like, yeah. define that. Or where they and, belong. Yeah, they need to go into their kind of place. It's like their kind of place is in this world with everybody else because we're all different. We all have different needs. We're not all the same. No, exactly. We all have different challenges, it, regardless of what it is in life. We all look different as well. Just because there's a diagnosis attached to somebody doesn't mean that they're any different than anybody else. Now, here's something that a lot of families um, struggle with. Please go into a little bit of detail with this, okay? Okay. Um, challenges with you at a younger age with you've already called them meltdowns um so i'll call them meltdowns i call them actually behavioral issues so challenges you had as a young boy with outbursts and as an adult with outbursts oh wow wow yeah. Um, challenges as a kid. Did you have a lot of outbursts when you were younger? Oh, yeah. I lost my temper a lot. When I got flustered and everybody could tell me, get to your homework, get to your homework, get to your homework, stupid. It's like I just yelled. Um, there were some altercations at home that I'm not going to go into detail about because of outbursts. Um, they've nope. all been for, they've all been forgiven and forgotten about um, you know no use rehashing them up um, as an adult yeah I've had outbursts I've had meltdowns around my wife and it's hurt our relationship but you know what I've actually put those into check um, there are times when I've melted down and she's been the victim of it and there's also times where I've learned from that and I've come home and I said 
She said, how was your day? I said, I had a really bad day right now. I feel like I'm going to freaking scream. I'm going to go into the other room. I'm going to decompress. I'm going to cool off. And when I come out, I'm going to talk to you about it like a rational person because she doesn't deserve that. She doesn't deserve that no. at all. No, and you and, and I uh, dealt with that uh, as an adult when, when you would have issues and you'd message me on Facebook, Tina, help me. Mm -hmm. I'm having a meltdown. And what would I tell you to do? Shut Take that a walk. computer off, get out of the house, and go for a walk because she doesn't deserve this. No, she doesn't. But you went for a walk, you came back, you messaged me immediately and say, Tina, I'm better. And I say, good, you need to do that every time. Yeah. And you've been doing great. So, Tom, as a young boy, that's as an adult dealing with those issues. As a young boy, how did you manage to be able to cope with addressing your behavioral issues, was there techniques that you used to cope with them or to deescalate yourself from having those? Kind of my thing was, is kind of locked myself away in my bedroom when I was a kid. And then um, just to be by myself, yeah. Then my then my parents would pull me out. They kind of didn't understand that. So you, you don't need to be antisocial. It's like I'm very antisocial. That's just how I am. Yeah. And then you know things didn't get much better. Um, my parents adopted my three brothers and my sister. And you know there was a time I had four people in a bedroom meant for one. And uh, but we did move into a bigger house. So I ended up getting my own room again. And it helped just to have that space to get. Um, away from it and I could be able to close the door and I could just get my stuff done and still I had little brothers who bugged me but you know what they're little brothers and I love them dearly as adults now um, yeah. but still it was good to have that to place to get away and to be able to do stuff but it was a lot of times it was a challenge a lot of times I was constantly surrounded by people I have uh I grew up with three brothers and two sisters or six kids and two parents and, you know, constantly had people around and it was, it was a challenge. So Tom, it still did, is you, a did you feel the more people that were around you nonstop, the harder it was and brought out behaviors or was it something specifically as in you being pushed to do something that triggered it? I think it was just people just trying to, poke the bear they're trying to trigger yeah. it just to have a laugh about it and and my dad always kept telling me ignore him ignore him it's like and i just realized how can i ignore them when one of the things about my diagnosis is i can hear everything at the same freaking volume at the same time you yeah. know i can hear it all the time and you know i mean even there's times as an adult today the most the best moments i have where i'm in my classroom I'm alone. The doors are closed. And I just take a little time to decompress and to just focus and to just go to my ice machine, grab a cold beverage and just sit down and just decompress everything. You know, I'll pop up. I have iTunes. I pop a video up on my Apple TV in my room and just decompress, relax and my wife texted me. She's like, honey, are you okay? And I was like, I just need to breathe a little bit. I need to catch up on some things. Give me a couple hours, and then we'll be home. We'll just have dinner, and we'll do our thing. And, uh, yeah, that's that works now. But as a kid, it was just constantly surrounded by people all the time and just people who could not understand this diagnosis that I had. And I felt like they sometimes I just felt like they didn't even want to, to understand yeah. it or that I used yeah, it as it, an excuse it, or something it can be a big challenge. I mean, I've even seen, I mean, I can tell now with Nathan by his body language, by the tone of his voice, just by even the way he looks, I can tell if there's going to be an issue and I'll nip it right there and then. But when it came to school, obviously anything that was new that was introduced would be introduced at home. I would introduce anything new at home and then the school would implement it so that the behaviors, I could um, deal with them at home so that the behaviors wouldn't start at school. Um, and it worked out fantastically. And a lot of parents that I've yeah. worked with have done the exact same thing. 
add those new those new modifications at home, work with them at home uh, in connection with the school as well still, still keep them in the loop. And then once you've got them a little bit down path, then introduce them into the school and then work closely with the school. But the school needs to be willing to do that as well. Now here's the thing. If they're willing to work closely with you, which many schools are because they need that extra help and support as well, the easier it is on the student, the easier it is on the classroom, the easier it is on the EA, the easier it is on the teacher. So everybody benefits from this if everybody yes. is willing to work together. Yes, one right? of the things I did, absolutely. One of the things I did as an educator because of during the pandemic, we're all doing school online. One of the things I did as an educator, and this is stuff that I have learned from being a student and not getting the help I needed. I want to make sure I gave the help I needed to parents as an educator. And one of the things I did is I actually put up a um, website for only the parents to access. And it shows all, like, I don't know how to work with my son on, on you're doing this stuff on knife skills. And I have kids who are special ed kids in my class, of course. I've told you about that. So I don't know how to put this. Oh, I did a knife cutting tutorial. It's up on the parent website. You can access it anytime you want. And I make sure that my parents, especially my parents of my functional, my FA kids, they have access to all that information to make sure that they can help their kids. And I told them, I'm an email away. I'm a phone call away. There are times I've been on Facebook chat messenger chat with parents with their students at home at eight o'clock at night just to make sure they got their work done i mean you have to do that you, i mean it, educators need to get involved and um right. they do and what was funny is my first day back a school last year we went through all this training and um, one of the teachers mr brian he said name a name a teacher who influenced, name somebody who influenced you becoming an educator. And I actually put down my fifth grade teacher who locked me in the school health room. And he said, uh -huh. why did you put her down? Why did you put her down? I said, because of my experience with her, she taught me that I needed to be the educator that I needed when I was a kid. So Tom, in ending this, okay, um, what our viewers don't know is we were doing this as a test drive today because our other one flopped with echoing. Yeah. Um, but we're going to be doing another interview with Tom in possibly a week. We will be asking a few questions, but Tom is actually a chef and Tom has written books on cooking. Tom will be doing a very simple recipe for parents that want to bring their loved ones on that um, they would like them to possibly learn how to start working in the kitchen by doing simple things, but also uh, Tom will be teaching them how to handle a knife properly, safely. Uh, so this is to let people know that we're gonna be doing another interview with Tom. We want people to be introduced to Tom so Tom could tell his story about where he was at a young boy to where he is now. So it's going to be a two-part series. Today is where he was. The next series, the next one that we're doing is he is actually going to be cooking from his kitchen that he teaches his students to cook at. That will be showing everybody where he is now from somebody that was told that he wouldn't accomplish much of anything to Tom showing everybody, look at me now. Right, Tom? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, I like I said before in our previous interview, um, all those written experts, all those all those expert opinions written down, I use them as toilet paper now. You know, Tom, because... you just gave me goosebumps talking about that because I've known you for a long time. And even over 10 years that I've known you, you've still done growth. I still see you growing. And it's amazing to watch how much growth you've done. And I'm actually really, really proud of what you've accomplished. Thank you. And I think this should be something positive for parents to look at. 
to show them that you were told that you wouldn't really amount to anything and you wouldn't learn much. And hey, look where you are now. And same with Absolutely. my son, Nathan. You know, I was yeah, told he's... he'd never talk, he'd never go to school. I'd be looking after him for the rest of his life because, you know, he wouldn't be able to. Yes, I will be looking after him for the rest of his life or until they can cure his seizures, but not because of his autism. His autism has nothing to do with, with no. what stunted him right now. You know, he's he's done so much growth through that. So, Tom, I'm like you. Hey, look at him now. He proved yeah. the doctors wrong. You've proved everybody wrong as well. And I'm still and, and I'm still not done. I mean, even next school year, um, I'm gonna be running an on camp. I'm gonna be running a brand new two and a half million dollar restaurant on our campus. You know, we're not done. We're not done. Nope. And you know what? All of my special ed kids are gonna be in there. They're gonna be learning skills. They're gonna be actually working in that restaurant and getting job experience. You know, if I can train. If I can train one of my FA students to work in a professional dish room, I'll give him a job for life. So we're not done. We're not done by a long shot. And if I have my choice, all of our centerpieces on all of our tables for the restaurant are going to be your son's birdhouses. Ah, uh, that would be so neat. But, Tom, I'm not done with you yet either. I mean, our interviews are not going to finish after our, our oh, interview. Oh, no. I mean, I'd love to show our viewers the growth in continuing growth with you um, because I'm actually, as a parent, looking at where you are now gives me so much incentive to where Nathan could be as well. Even though I know Nathan has so much potential, even more than what he's shown me now, and let me tell you, he has shown me a lot. Oh, yeah. That kid has educated me like there's no tomorrow uh, on things that I didn't even understand. Um, but you know what? It, get to know the person. Get to know their strengths. It's okay to know some weaknesses, but don't dwell on those. Get to know their strengths. Yeah. And yeah. Help them build on those strengths and, like you and, have. And my most important thing, and I learned this from a friend of mine, um, Never underestimate the power you give someone by believing in them. And for any parent out there, here's the message I want to give to you. If you show your child who has a special disability or autism spectrum, it doesn't matter. If you show them, hey, I believe in you, you can succeed. If they believe it long enough, they're going to believe it themselves. And if they believe it hard enough, they're going to achieve it. I, I agree. And also the the different variation of us never underestimate the power you give yourself by believing in you. And when I started believing in me and said, screw you to all these so-called experts, that's when I started to succeed. That's when I started to grow. And that's when, okay, oh, I graduated from college. Oh, I got my teaching credential. Oh, I'm in a job where I make $67,000 a year, you know, I'm supposed to be the guy who was supposed to be bagging groceries for minimum wage. Now, is it Tom? You're married too. Yeah, I got a beautiful wife. I've been married. This coming April will be 20 years. Yep, yep. Nice, nice person. She's a very, very nice person. You guys match very, very well. So, Tom, we're going to end this. We're going to be uh, interviewing you in the next week or so on you teaching people on the spectrum and other special needs as well. And yeah. I use that in quotations because, you know what, they're all able. It's how we teach them and how we modify them. No one's uh, disabled. They're learn. differently abled. Yep, exactly, exactly. So, Tom, in saying this, my friend, thank you so very much, and we will talk soon. All right, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.